Good news, everyone. We're almost to the self-evident stage with mask wearing. Bad news. The United States is going to do everything possible to have a horrible economic response to this. It's going to reward exactly those who shouldn't be rewarded. Hello, everyone. This is Chris Martinson with your SARS-CoV-2, a.k.a. the Honey Badger Virus Update. Daily update for March 31st, 2020, day 68. I'm calling this worse than I thought, and that's referring to the economic, fiscal, and monetary responses of the United States. And uh, while I get there, I'm just going to, uh, while I talk about that, I'm just going to play this for you here. And uh, this is showing the overall number of uh, cases over time. You see the time over here. And these are the titles of the videos that I was putting out appearing in lockstep with that. So just so you can see the United States starting out here, it started out at 60. You see this uh, is only at 6,000 is the max here. South Korea, of course, came out of the gate first. We're like, oh, gosh, look at that. Um, but what happened since then is we had a lot of time to be adjusting to this. We had a lot of time to see this coming. And by we, I mean the managers. I can't call them leaders anymore, but the managers of various countries. Some of them actually were leaders and have done a really fantastic job. Again, Kuwait, Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea have done really a fantastic job. But other countries, for whatever reason, have been absolutely unable to use logic and to think past whatever attachment they had to business, to money, to the economy, that those became the prime values of these countries before the first principle of saving lives and that we're all in this together and that we're all here to live our lives in order to um, be alive and be joyous and be happy. And, and uh, the idea that preserving some corporate profits was uh, paramount to any other considerations, it's it's still true in some countries. And I think that's true in the United States at this point in time. We are still not operating as if uh, we are going to be um, managing this in the best interests of the people. And I'm seeing very disturbing cases where doctors and nurses and an Amazon employee are being fired for daring to speak out about the unsafe conditions they're being forced to work in so that the people who are doing the firing of them can earn a few more bucks. All right. I thought that was a really effective presentation on that. I just wanted to show that to you. And um, just before we go on, I do want to combat something, which is this headline up here, which is nobody could have foreseen this. This is a meme that's now starting. I'm seeing it all over the place. And it's really the managerial class working hard to um, deflect blame off of themselves for having managed it so poorly. But I just want you to know that I first began tracking this closely the week of January 13th. On the 23rd, I issued an alert to everybody who is my subscribers and to all my readers, um, calling this as having all the hallmarks of a true pandemic right there in that first alert that I put together writing late into the night of the 22nd. And um, that was just uh, really, you know what my trigger was? It was seeing the lockdown of Wuhan. Because, come on, you can interpret that, um, look beyond the words. Remember, I trust actions not words. So the actions of the Chinese government in locking down a city of 11 million people told me that there was something about this virus that was very, very bad. Uh, it obviously wasn't just, um, you know, a, a flu or something close to that, because come on, China doesn't care about human lives like that. So we know that. At any rate, uh, the first video to the world came out on January 24th. And I just want to highlight a couple of things. It was on the 27th that I declared this officially a pandemic by all of the hallmarks that the WHO themselves uh, abandoned and then later had to resurrect uh, more than a month and a half later. And I called for the immediate halt of all flights from China at that point in time. That's just what made sense. On February 2nd, I reported the data of both asymptomatic and post-symptomatic um, uh, viral loads. So asymptomatic transfer for sure, post-symptomatic transfer was reported then. We're not sure if that's the case, but for sure there are viral loads in post-symptomatic people. Again, we still don't know if those are infective or not. Um, February 4th noted that China was fudging the data. We had all that stuff showing they were putting, plugging it into a model where it wasn't an exponential growth model, but a quadratic model. And so uh, found somebody who had that model and uh, and presented that. And then on February 9th presented the fact that this thing is an aerosol or spreads by, by something like aerosol uh, transmission. Even if it's not a true aerosol, it's aerosol droplets. Close enough. All right. Moving on to today's numbers. Uh, this is March 30th data. So again, day old. And when we look at this, uh, what do we see? 20,000 new cases for the United States, heavily concentrated in a few places, New York, Louisiana, places like that. Some real serious hotspots ongoing here. 
uh, now 3,000 deaths in the United States. Italy, they have bent their curve. Um, They're now down at 4,000 cases per day. Uh, Deaths are going to continue to climb for quite a while, 800 there. Spain, almost cracking the 1,000 mark in deaths there. Um, But Italy bending that curve, how? Well, unfortunately, we saw some of the consequences of how they've done it. When you do a complete quarantine and a lockdown, people get hungry, they get antsy. Italy did it by imposing a full lockdown, and that's what you have to do. That's the hammer to get your get this under control. And then what's the dance? Well, then you have to figure out how you can intelligently allow people back into the workforce. And as we've discussed, a lot of intelligent ways you could do that. Spain still really battling here, um, going up the curve. They they still have more cases in front of them. And um, when we look here at the total deaths compared to total recovered, we can see the case resolution is actually pretty poor in this. It takes a long time to be declared recovered. And unfortunately, we're seeing more and more cases. I don't have good data around this yet. It's still more or less anecdotal uh, about secondary infections where people representing as positive after having been cleared. And a couple reasons that could be, but we don't know if that's them actually getting infected again. That would be very bad news. Or better news would be they had a false positive the first time. They didn't actually have COVID-19. And then later they did get it. Um, That would be the best news we could hope for in this story. China talking about zero new cases, zero deaths. So uh, they've completely, completely contained this thing, or they're being totally not honest about that. Um, You decide. And uh, Germany, I've had people, you know, I said yesterday, listen, a good chance that Germany is our gold standard here because they've tested so many people, noting here even that they do have about a 1% case fatality rate when you're just comparing total deaths to total cases, which of course is not the right way to do that because these cases are all in flight. Many of these cases are going to progress over to becoming serious or critical, and some of those will progress to being dead. So uh, Germany, it, it may still be true that um, uh, we're going to have to just reserve judgment on that. A lot, Several of you have come out and said, uh, please, be, please be a little more cautious. Germany may or may not uh, be uh, as it appears by the numbers here. France really struggling here and uh, having a, a very difficult time containing this at this point in time. They're having more trouble, at least from what I'm reading in newspapers, convincing and containing their people, convincing their people to stay in quarantine and do social isolation, distancing, things like that. So the, the remember, the ability of this virus to spread is a function of its intrinsic qualities times a lot of variables that have to do with your culture. And how rapidly will people move to face masks? How rapidly will people move to social distancing? How rapidly will people become conscious, aware, alert of how not to be either infective or become infected? That's all cultural. And so as we look through that, France is uh, apparently going to have, they're having some trouble getting there in uh, in terms of uh, running their NPIs. Uh, UK moving up pretty good. Belgium moving up pretty good. Switzerland moving up pretty good. Uh, Look, almost everybody's over the 10,000 mark on this uh, page, probably by tomorrow. Um, Yeah, we might get there. And uh, we're going to see a lot. We'll probably get to the case soon where everybody on here is a four-digit number, especially as soon as South Korea rolls off the bottom of this page, which they should probably do by tomorrow at this pace. Um, And Canada now with a big increase excuse me, 1,100 cases there coming in, and death's still pretty far back, but but climbing. So uh, Canada's coming along here. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to move off of the cases more or less and, and just move into some responses and then economic stuff. So let's take a quick peek here. I am following uh, God here on Twitter. That's at the Tweet of God. I like uh, God's following one. I like that. That's smart. Uh So CBS News noted that 1,200 people attended a Louisiana church service to find coronavirus ban. We will continue, they said. Tweet of God said, see you all soon. Uh, Look, he's wearing a face mask here. So uh, that's a little little gallows humor, um, which I guess, you know, forgive me for, but but I have to, uh, I just have to relieve the pressure somehow because honestly, the prediction here, that church service killed people. You put 1,200 people in that room. And, uh, you know, given uh, the general state of health of people in the United States, guaranteed it killed some people. Because notice here uh, we had, before I go into this story that's on the screen right now, remember there was that uh, in South Korea, one of their biggest cluster outbreaks was in that church that they had over there described as a cult, but a very tight church. And one of the things that church did when they had the most infective period was they all got together and they were singing. And singing together apparently 
I'm going to call it right now. Singing together is a very bad thing to do uh, around a respiratory virus like this. So in the Los Angeles Times today, no, yeah, what's that? Uh, two days ago, there was this article, a choir decided to go ahead with rehearsal. Now, dozens of members have COVID-19 and two are dead. With the coronavirus quickly spreading in Washington state in early March, leaders of the Skagit Valley uh, Choral dis- debated whether to go ahead with a weekly rehearsal. But Skagit County hadn't reported any cases. Schools and businesses remained open and prohibitions on large gatherings had yet to be announced. So that's a hard case right there. You know, people around you aren't wearing masks. Nobody seems to have it. You know it's out there somewhere. This is one of the hardest moments to be a leader and say, you know what, we can't get together around this. And of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. But uh, as it unfolded on March 6, Adam Burdick, the choir's uh, conductor, informed the 121 members in an email that amid the stress and strain of concerns about the virus, practice would proceed as scheduled at Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church. I'm planning on being there this Tuesday, March 10th, and I hope many of you will be too, he wrote. Sixty singers showed up. A greeter offered hand sanitizer at the door, so that's good. Members refrained from the usual hugs and handshakes. It seemed like a normal rehearsal, except that choirs are huggy places, Burdick recalled. We were making music and trying to keep a certain distance between each other. After two and a half hours, the singers parted ways. Nearly three weeks later, 45 have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or ill with the symptoms, and at least three have been hospitalized, two are dead. Out of 60, 45 got infected. So if they were doing any singing here, I can guarantee you the prediction is that church service killed some people. The outbreak has stunned county officials who have concluded that the virus was almost certainly transmitted through the air from one or more people without symptoms. Yeah, again, this is why it's just so important because, again, I know like here on on March 10th that, you know, it was hard to make that call and make that decision. But for me, it really wasn't because uh, over, over a month earlier, we had presented that aerosol data and we had presented more than a month, a month and a few days before that um, uh, maybe a month and a week earlier, that it, you have both the symptomatic, the asymptomatic transmission, right? Okay, so that's really what caught them here was, you know, that they were unaware of that information. And that's too bad because, honestly, it shouldn't have been me with my limited reach on this YouTube channel trying to warn people through these videos. This data should have been trumpeted out there by the CDC, by the WHO, by the relevant associated health bodies of every major country. This information should have gotten out there. So it's not this church choral director's job to know about all of this stuff and have to hunt it down. That's not their job. Their job was to run a good music session. But they should have been informed, absolutely should have been informed by somebody. Now, this person and whoever decided to organize this whole thing, that was just being dumb. And, and hopefully they've got liability that associates and attaches with that because no question about it, this was a terrible decision at this late stage here uh, because this was held uh, just yesterday on the 30th. All right. Again, how do we beat this thing? Well, it starts by everybody wearing a mask. That, it's, that's pretty simple, right? It's, that's a simple solution to a very complex problem. The three reasons everyone wears a face mask, I've sort of changed up bullet point two, but the first bullet point is it stops infected people from expelling their infectious particles all over the place. So you don't have to clean them up and they're not floating around and they're not infecting people. Uh, Number two, a mask, if you're wearing it, it prevents you, physically prevents you from touching your face holes. Remember, it's not touching your face because your face doesn't get the virus. The virus goes in through your mouth through your nose, and in rare cases, or in less frequent cases, in through the eyes. It's got to find a wet membrane. It absolutely cannot go through the skin. So uh, having a mask touching uh, your mouth and your nose, covering your mouth and your nose, if you do accidentally unconsciously touch them, guess what? You didn't touch the actual face hole itself. So da-da, ding, that's good. Three, hey, if you get infected anyway. So you have a much better chance of starting small with a small load, a small low inoculum, and that gives you a better disease outcome. All right. So we're almost there with the face mask. Just heard today the CDC is considering recommending the general public wear face coverings. All right. We're almost there to the self-evident stage. In fact, it's, it's breaking quickly. Masks are now compulsory in Bulgaria has just made wearing a protective mask in public compulsory. Austria makes masks compulsory as protection debate shifts. So uh, that happened, uh, I think, two days ago. And a town in Germany, Jena, 
uh, says only with a protective mask can you go into supermarkets and local transport. So that's being required there. So these are all examples where it's starting to pop up and it's going to be everywhere before you know it. And everybody's going to be wearing a face mask. And before you know it, it's going to be socially awkward to not have a face mask. And people are going to be giving you the stink eye if you try and get into a, onto a bus or a train or walk around in public without a face mask. So if you want to be a trendsetter and you want to be on the early curve, wear your face mask now and help other people feel comfortable with it earlier than they otherwise might if it turns out you live in an area, as I do, where people aren't yet wearing face masks all that regularly. Here's a typical refrain I hear. I just pulled this off of a uh, chat area of a website that I go to. It says, the number of people who've died who are over 60 and who did not have existing health conditions is very small. So this refrain here is being trotted out quite a bit, and it's being used to, I believe, suggest that if I read between the lines, it's kind of heartless and it's saying, you know, it's only old people and and they were sick anyway. So the, I guess the virus just gave them a little push in the back down the stairwell. Uh, I, I, that's the typical refrain. But I, I need to combat that a little bit and note, remember, the Italian data gave us all these comorbidities. 33% of people who did die in this study had ischemic heart disease. So that's a, a coronary heart disease, right? So that ischemic means uh, without oxygen. And the way your heart gets started with oxygen is you have coronary artery disease and your arteries are pinched or blocked, right? So you have uh, ischemic, you know, low or insufficient oxygen. Another thing that would show up here very big is arterial hypertension at 76%. That was a biggie. Diabetes clocking in at 35% as well. Not listed on this comorbidity, but we did present it from elsewhere, is just obesity itself. So now let's look at that typical refrain again, but this time with context. Hey, it's only people who are over 60 and, uh, and, and they had pre-existing health conditions, right? Well, let's look at the data then. Nearly half of adults in the United States have hypertension. So if hypertension is a big deal, then half of people have it. So this isn't a small number. It's not, you know, this is a sort of a minimizing statement up here. It says, well, it's only people over 60, you know, and they, and they had pre-existing conditions. Well, there's a lot of pre-existing going on in the United States and other OECD countries, um, Italy being being one, uh, the UK being another, where this is true. How about this? Uh, how about diabetes? The prevalence in America, 34.2 Americans or 10.5% of the population had diabetes. And again, diabetes it was as a comorbidity that was really associated with a bad outcome, in this case, death, right? So if you had zero pathologies, almost nobody showed up. 0.8% of the deaths had zero pathologies. But if you had one, that was 25% of the total deaths. And if you had two, that was another 25%. If you had three or more, that was half of all deaths. So having more pathologies was, was not helpful. Well, then how about that cardiovascular disease or the ischemic heart disease? Well, here we're showing up with um, nearly half of all adults in the United States have some type of cardiovascular disease. But to focus down a little bit, it turns out that 15.5 million people in the U.S. have um, – uh, cardiovascular heart disease, the reported prevalence increases with age for both men and women. Um, and what are the risk factors? Old age, yep. Diabetes, yeah. Obesity, right? So, um, yeah, uh, there's 15 million people who've got that. And then uh, if we look at obesity data in the United States, obesity rates now exceed 35%. In nine states, 30% in 31 states, 25% in 48 states. So um, West Virginia highest at 39, Colorado lowest at 23. So how where would we average all that out at? Um, I don't know, high 20s probably. So, so call it 30% just to, to make it easy. So now when we talk about trying to minimize this as saying, well, it's really just people who have a pre-existing condition. That's a lot of people, right? That, that's what we're talking about. And by the way, you know, it's just those people who are over 60 also tends to just push off this whole idea, well, it's just the people who die that we really need to worry about here. But this is Minnesota Department of Health data. And here, look at the cases, uh, the number of confirmed cases. Look at this bell curve. Most of the cases are clocking in for people who are 20 to 44, Next is 45 to 64, and then 65 or more years. So that's that's the shape. It's a very not not a bell curve at all. It's a very asymmetrical distribution, right? And um, as well, uh, look at this of the hospitalized cases. The median age 
that's half higher, half lower, is 63. Um, hospitalized cases in the ICU, the median age is 62. So half the cases were older, half were younger than 62. The median age for dying, of course, is 86. But let's not minimize and skip past. Once you're hospitalized, especially once you're in the ICU, this is going to be a very long expensive trip in the ICU and a very long recovery, possibly with permanent lung damage going forward. So the age range here, uh, hospitalized cases, 6 to 95, and uh, hospitalized in the ICU, 33 to 95, okay? Youngest death, 58, oldest, 95. Not a huge sample set here, but uh, at least it gives us a sense that we can't just say, Let's minimize this by saying, well, mostly it's people who are over 60 and, you know, they've got pre-existing conditions. A lot of people have pre-existing conditions and it doesn't just hit the old. Okay. Hey, here we have a modern version of a bread line. This is hundreds of cars waiting to receive food from the Greater Community Food Bank in Duquesne. Uh, collection begins at noon. So there's 800 cars, they said, in this lineup here. And if we said the average car costs $10,000, 800 times 10000 it's 8 million bucks of hardware lining up. Not like this bread lines of old where people had tattered shoes and, and, the, and the clothes on their back. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is how it's looking and presenting today. That's a pretty big difference from before. And um, the other response I wanted to talk about is in Virginia, you all heard, I'm sure, the Virginia governor issued a stay-at-home order until June 10th. Let's see, it's uh, March 31st, so that's April, May. That's two and a half months, effectively. All right, I want to dive a little bit further into the economy here. Uh, First, I want to talk about China's economy. This is something called the Purchasing Managers Index, and it measures activity. Anything over 50 says healthy expansion in the economy. Apparently, China is uh, reporting that they are completely back to normal and and they are uh, expanding robustly. I, I guess the only way that we could interpret this differently is if they were going to report that that was just they're expanding compared to last month. Of course, that would be hard not to expand. Um, but this is really was put out to sort of show China is back to work. And uh, thankfully, we have the CCP telling us they're back to work. And you got CNBC reporting it as if it were truth. Um, here in March 30th, uh, it says here, China's industries resume production as government officials ease restrictions. Nearly all of China's major industrial companies have reportedly resumed production. Chinese officials put the number at over 95% of large enterprises, including the hard-hit province of Hubei, after much of the country's economy shut down to contain the honey badger virus. But back to work doesn't mean back to normal. Okay, glad to have that qualifier in here. Chinese officials say major enterprise in the country's main industrial belt, the provinces of Jiangsu, Zhejiang, Guangdong, are basically fully open. But... But a quarter of small and medium-sized businesses in China are still shut down. Ah, You know, a quarter of small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, Yeah, about that. So one of the things you produce when you're producing at industrial scale is you make a lot of, uh, in this case, uh, NO2, nitric oxide emissions come from burning stuff. This is uh, the emissions as, as captured by satellite data in December of 2019. That would be sort of baseline. And here's what it looked like in the 10 days uh, averaged up to 16th of March. Of course, you know, that's a couple of weeks ago. Maybe they've gotten completely back to work since then. But the way I look at this, this is nowhere near what we would call back to work compared to this. Um, so even if 95% are functioning, they're not functioning at full capacity, according to this. So uh, I'm going to call this and this uh, CCP propaganda for the most part. I get why they're doing it, but I'm just saying, let's let's be cautious. I don't think they're back to work like that yet. Yesterday, I talked about how uh, the Total Cares Act was seeking to bail out everything and everybody, just not equally, and talked about all this. But this is just, this is a part of it. This is chump change compared to the really, really big bailout that's happening. And it's happening quietly, and it's happening with your tax dollars. If you're a U.S. citizen, it's happening behind the scenes. And so what's happening is what we could call here a case of privatized gains and socialized losses. This was a really great article by Jim Bianco, and uh, I consider him to be a a friend on Twitter. Uh, We know each other through that. The Fed's cure risks being worse than the disease. This is really great writing. Um, So let's go through this because this is all the stuff the Fed is doing. And what, what are they doing? They're bailing out hedge funds, 
big money speculators, big banks, people who make money by using money. Those are financialized people. These are mostly the Fed's bailing out people who don't produce anything. Um, and they just are, are the very wealthiest. So you need to understand that because while they do that, they're putting the taxpayer on the hook for this if it goes wrong. Jim explains how. In just these past few weeks, the Fed has cut rates by 150 basis points to near zero and run through its entire 2008 crisis handbook. That wasn't enough to calm markets, though, so the central bank also announced a trillion a day in repurchase agreements and unlimited quantitative easing, which includes a hard-to-understand $625 billion of bond buying a week going forward. At this rate, the Fed will own two-thirds of the Treasury market in a year so this will just be the central bank just fully monetizing uh, the U.S. deficits and debts. It's going to be astonishing. But it's alphabet soup of new programs that deserve special consideration as they could have profound long-term consequences for the functioning of the Fed and the allocation of capital and financial markets. Specifically, these are CPFF, the commercial paper funding facility, which is buying commercial paper from the issuer. The issuer is like if uh, Coca-Cola wants to issue a bond, it would normally go to the bond market. The bond market would evaluate that, say, hmm, you know, here's the rate of interest that we think is fair, all things considered. And uh, then Coke would have to uh, attract those particular uh, investors. In this case, what we're talking about is the Fed going straight to commercial paper issuers and buying the bonds directly. So this is the Fed funneling money straight to companies. The primary market corporate credit facility, the PMCCF, is buying corporate bonds from the issuer. Ooh, uh, corporate bonds. This is commercial paper. Uh Uh-oh, term asset-backed securities loan facility. This is a funding backstop backstop for asset-backed securities. So this is all the stuff that went wrong in the first uh, housing crisis and the great financial crisis 2008. Guess what? It came back. You know why it came back? Well, because there were no consequences back then and because you can make a lot of money bundling up uh, asset-backed securities and selling them off, and it all works great until things go bad. And then, luckily, the Fed rides to your rescue, buys them from you. All right. The SMCCF is buying corporate bonds and bond ETFs in the secondary market, so this isn't sufficient buying them straight from the issuers here for commercial paper corporate bonds. But now they're going out and buying ETFs in the so-called secondary market. And uh, this is all driving up the prices of these bonds enormously. And how about the Main Street Business Lending Program? Details are to come, but it will lend to eligible small and medium-sized businesses, complementing efforts by the SBA. Um, And so how can it do this? Is the Fed allowed to do all this stuff? The answer is no, it can't do that. Jim continues, to put it bluntly, the Fed isn't allowed to do any of this. The central bank is only allowed to purchase or lend against securities that have government guarantee. So that included, uh, this includes treasury securities, agency mortgage-backed securities, and the debt issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So by the way, these agency mortgage-backed securities, Fannie and Freddie, they issue these mortgage-backed securities. You know what's going bad right about now? Mortgage-backed securities. You know what should be happening to mortgage-backed securities prices? They should be falling. And because of that, people who owned those would actually be losing money. I'm going to get to it in a minute and show you that the Fed is making sure that anybody who was a big player who is uh, playing around in these markets will not be losing any money. An argument can be made that can also include municipal securities, but nothing in the laundry list above. So how can they do this? The Fed will announce a special purpose vehicle, SPV, A special purpose vehicle. That's just a legal construct. I can explain it. It's not that hard to understand. So don't get lost in the in the jargon here. But they're going to create this special purpose vehicle for each acronym. What are those acronyms? These things here. For each acronym to conduct these operations, the Treasury, using the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which is uh, parked in the Treasury, which means it is taxpayer backed, will make an equity investment in each SPV and be a first loss position. So if there are going to be losses, if all this money goes out the door and it turns out it was a bad idea buying any of this stuff at full price and there's losses to be taken, who's going to take the loss? Well, it's the treasury. Who's the treasury? That's the taxpayer. So the Fed is going to provide all the money so that the treasury can throw it at all these really dumb ideas out here. By the way, there's going to be big losses cracking up in some of these 
And if that goes bad, the taxpayer's on the hook for that. So what does this mean? In essence, the Treasury, not the Fed, is buying all these securities and backstopping of loans. The Fed is acting as the banker and providing the financing. The Fed hired BlackRock Incorporated to purchase these securities and handle the administration of the SP fees on behalf of the owner of the Treasury. And oh, by the way, BlackRock is going to be able to buy out of uh, some of these funds that it owns itself. So conflict of interest there. At any rate, the taxpayer is really being put on the hook for bailing out all of this paper and all this crazy stuff, including backstop for asset-backed securities again. We learned nothing from the first one. So let's look at this. Here we see this is, uh, these are some of these Fannie and Freddie, uh, these are Fannie bonds. And these things, notice here in March, they started to really fall in price. They started to fall in price. They're falling in price, right? And so anybody who owned these was losing money. And then all of a sudden the Fed said, hey, we're going to start buying those. And next thing you know, they're not even at, at, this is par. This is what they were issued at, at 100. That would be the same price as these investors bought it at. Before they'd even taken any losses, the Fed said, we'll buy them. And next thing you know, they're going to be selling these things at a profit. So no losses for the 0.1% because the 0.1% are mostly the ones who own most of these anyway, by you know 0.1% of wealthy. Uh, Lisa writes here today, the Fed's decision to buy corporate bonds has turned everyone into a buyer and yet net downgrades among investment grade bonds accelerated to 110 billion on Monday from 91 billion on Friday. The pace of downgrades continues to accelerate from the record pace reached last week, according to B of A research. As the downgrades happen, the prices for these bonds fall, looks like this, and the holders of those would actually be losing money. But guess what? The Fed's going to buy those now and make sure that nobody loses any money. And you know what that, I I tweeted in response to that, I said, this is a massive bailout of the current 0.1% holders of corporate bonds. Same as if your worst performing 401k holding was being bought by the Federal Reserve for as much or more than you paid. This is flat out, it's disgusting, it's unfair, it's demoralizing. It's idiotic. Why is it demoralizing? Because if I invest in the market and I have a 401k and I experience some losses in there, the Fed never comes forward and says, here, we'll buy those things from you, Chris. We'll, we'll reach into your 401k, find your worst performing thing that you bought, the dog, the bad investment idea. You made a bad bet. It didn't go your way. We're going to take that worst thing out of your portfolio. And you know what? We're not only going to pay you what you bought it for, we'll give you a little extra for your trouble. That's what's happening here. And uh, that's really really unfortunate. And it's terrible uh, for any sense of fairness, justice, equality, a sense of togetherness. It's all about the fourth turning, right? This is You could not possibly engineer a better way to put rocket fuel on top of people's loss of faith in institutions to watch the big banks and the big bankers and the Treasury Department all conspiring together to bail themselves and all their rich friends out while throwing relative pennies to actual individuals, a thousand bucks a person for you, but all, you know, hundreds of billions for large corporations and trillions. There's four point five trillion dollars on the hook here to bail out all the people who inappropriately owned bad things that went, the investments that went bad. All right. Uh, with that, resubscribe if you can stand hearing screeds like that, because that's what we're down to now. Is is uh, I'm really annoyed that that where we could be doing things that could really be helping individuals. What we're doing instead is bailing out people who made the same stupid mistakes they made back in 2008. And the first instinct of my country in the United States always is to bail out all the big players. And I know, I know, they're like, oh, if we don't do this, everything will collapse. You know what? Maybe these people should lose a lot of money and maybe a couple of big institutions ought to collapse. And maybe next time they won't do all this junk again. That would be, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. All right. Conclusions for today, never letting a good crisis go to waste. Wall Street and corporate America are busy making sure all the losses are borne by the public. That's the taxpayers both now and in the future. If we look at it this way, um, people are getting 1200 bucks today on an individual basis If you, if you, um, as long as you are earning 75000 or less, which a lot of people don't now qualify for getting any money, of course, in that story. But you get that $1,200 today, you got to pay taxes on it because, hey, it's income. And then you're going to get an $8,000 bill for that $1,200 later on. That's that's how this all sort of uh, shakes out right now. This is completely, it's radically, totally unfair. And it doesn't make any short-term sense, doesn't make any long-term sense. It's just uh, uh, pigs at the trough. It's really, that's that's what we're watching right now. 
And of course, a crisis is a great time to push stuff like that through. So that's really what happened. And your representatives in Congress and the Senate have let you down and failed you if you think this is unfair. Mask wearing, good news, is being mandated in an increasing number of places. It's going to be everywhere soon. Um, So we can stop pushing that because we'll move on to the next thing. That'll be great. Large comorbidities in many OECD countries, they really are going to point to a higher death rate uh, than you see in some of the uh, healthier countries at this point. And reacting to these really grotesque uh, bailouts of the very, very wealthy and the speculators and the money masters makes me want to reframe this this way. You know what? It doesn't have to be this way. Present tense. It doesn't have to be this way. It's not. We don't have to reward the big speculators and the wealthiest of the wealthy. We don't have to assure that they don't take any losses on their precious holdings while everybody else is suffering. It. We don't. Ha- we there's still time to change this. So it doesn't have to be this way. But uh, it turns out it is that way at the present. So listen, we can wear masks. We can do that. We can help those truly in need. That's what we. That's how it should be. If we want to say, well, if it doesn't have to be this way, what way should it be? Great. Wear masks. Help those truly in need, and not reward these dumbass speculators in the 0.1% class that lost a few bucks, right? That Because you know why? Because they'll do it again. And that's why they're in this position again. This is why they're crying for their bailouts, because they're in a stupid position again of needing them when they could have learned, should have learned in 2008, but they weren't allowed to take their losses then either, so they didn't learn their lessons. Just like kids. Just like kids. You got to you, you experience. Tuition has to have a fairly high cost for it to be meaningful. No lessons learned means you get there again. And that's really the interpretation of this. No lessons learned after 2008. Got totally back in trouble into the same ways again. Everybody's crying for a bailout up here. They're going to get it because they're well-connected. Meanwhile, um, you get 1200 bucks. So hope that's okay with you. Remember, plant a garden because I'm pretty sure we're going to see um, food and vegetable shortages coming along later this year. Plus, you're going to love doing that. All right. That's all I have for today. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Goodbye. Hi, folks. Adam Taggart here. Chris Martinson and I are the co-founders of Peak Prosperity. If you want to get alerted whenever we release a new video from Chris, just click the red subscribe button right beneath the YouTube video player. Once you've done that, a little bell icon will appear right next to it. Click on that bell. It looks like this. And that's it. The next time we publish a video from Chris, you'll immediately receive a notification from YouTube. Thanks for watching our videos.